Good afternoon and welcome to you all to our wonderful program that is called Maritime Ports of the Americas Navigating to Economic Resilience. It is an honor and a privilege to be organizing this wonderful event and have such distinguished speakers this, this afternoon. Uh, we, we are very proud and very honored to have uh, the United States uh, West and East Coast as well as Mexico. I would like to thank uh, the California, the Northeast, uh, uh, located in New York and the Interamica chapter in Miami, as well as the chapter in Houston for putting this wonderful program together. Um, as, as we know, this is an opportunity to learn uh, what is going on right now with uh, the situation and the trade between Mexico, the United States and the world. And uh, it is with great honor and pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Maricela Caraballo. She's uh, not only uh, the, um, the Director of, of Trade Development from the Port of Los Angeles, but she's also one of our very distinguished board members of the California chapter. Uh, the Port has been a member of the chamber for over 25 years, so we have a lot of history and a lot of friendship. And I wanna thank Maricela and Norman Arikawa for doing that for so many years. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my, my dear friend, uh, Maricela Caraballo. Welcome, Maricela. Thank you, Maricela. Hey. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us virtually for the Maritime Ports of the Americas, Navigating to Economic Resilience Program, hosted by the United States Mexico Chamber of Commerce. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of our guests, business executives, and members from the various chapters throughout the United States and Mexico, and from the numerous time zones. A sincere, warm welcome. Thank you, Marlene Marikin, Executive Director of the California Chapter from Los Angeles. Thank you, Clementina Gay, Executive Director of the Inter-American Chapter for Miami. And thank you, Alejandro Ramos, Executive Director of the Northeast Chapter from New York, for organizing and bringing together all of us to have a dialogue about the economic resilience it will take from the maritime ports of the Americas and alongside the need to continue to build and foster bilateral trade and investment between the U.S. and Mexico. It takes a lot of collaboration to put together a program of such A-list speakers from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States and to the heart of Mexico to have this discussion. Allow me to introduce our moderator, Mr. Jorge Duran, Chief Secretariat of the Inter-American Committee on Ports with the Organization of American States. Jorge has worked for over 30 years with the government and the private sector of the Americas in the design and implementation of development projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. Since 2003, Jorge has served the Organization of American States in several key high-level capacities. Previously, Jorge worked at the Latin American Institute of Educational Communication in Mexico City as the Director of Regional Cooperation and Vice President of International Affairs. Notably, Jorge worked for the Presidency of Mexico as an Advisor of Science and Technology Policy and for the Mexican Ambassador of the United Nations as a Special Assistant. On the educational front, Jorge has been an associate professor at the Tecnológico de Monterrey in the Universidad Iberoamericana, where he taught courses in Latin America's political economy and history. I encourage all of you to read his bio, which demonstrates a highly educated individual holding multiple master's degrees from George Washington University and from American University in the areas of science and technology policy, international affairs, psychology, and Latin America studies and is very well versed to moderate this program. Welcome, Jorge Duran. Thank you very much, Maricela. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon to this webinar on, uh, on, uh, on ports of the Americas navigating to economic, res economic resiliency, organized, of course, by the United States, Mexico Chamber of Commerce, uh, with some support of, of the SIP, which we were happy to give, and, and the support of our panelists today. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jorge Duran, and like Maricela said, uh, said, I am the chief of the secretary of the Inter-American Committee on Ports, known as SIP. And as you know, the SIP brings together the national port authorities of the 35 member states of the OAS, from Canada to Argentina, through Central America and the Caribbean, with the purpose of promoting the development of ports that are competitive, that are safe, that are sustainable, and that are inclusive. And uh, so in addition to, to advising the governments and promoting this development of the ports, we also uh, have a heavy hand on training, which we believe to be key uh, 
uh, element for development, such as this webinar. And in that sense, I'd very much like to thank the US-Mexico Chamber of Commerce for taking this initiative and bringing these three panelists together. Uh, as, as we've heard, we've had, we, we will have, of course, uh, Mr. Daniels from the Port of Everglades. We'll have Mr. Eh, Miguel Angel Yanez from the Port of Veracruz in Mexico. And last but not least, we'll have Mr. Gene Siroca from the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, hello, Gene. Welcome everybody uh, to this event. The panelists will go on and discuss, as, as you know, and this is why you're here, current situation and preparedness to, to certain emerging challenges. Uh, they talk about how the, the ports have made it possible to, on the one hand, uh, uh, be safe and, and, and prevent contagion, and on the other side, keep trade flowing and keep logistic moving. Now, uh, that said, they will also address several of the of human, social, logistic, and economic aspects that, that COVID and this pandemic has impacted in their ports, and they're going to tell us all about that. They'll also speak a little bit uh, about digitization. They'll talk a little bit about analysis and forecast. And lastly, but not, not, not at, the, at the end, they will speak and will speak in a dialogue about, about the cruise industry and, and, and what the outlook for that is. So before I turn it over to our first uh, panelist, uh, I am going to um, remind everybody a little bit of the dynamics. So I know that your cameras and your microphones are turned off. That is the way that they will remain throughout. Uh, during the conference, during the webinar, you, the public, will be able to ask questions through either the uh, chat or the question and answer uh, uh, icon on your screen. And I, as a moderator, will be fielding those questions and writing them down. And at the end of the presenters, of the third presenter, I will then make them the questions that I've received from the audience. I will do this in a way that it is thematic, so I won't personalize the questions. They will be thematic. Uh, I will remind you also that today um, that this session is being recorded and, and, and Clementina uh, and, and the rest of the staff from the U.S. Mexican Chamber of Commerce will, will, um, will let us know and will send, a, send us the link. So uh, that said, again, I welcome you to this webinar on maritime ports of the Americas navigating to economic resiliency, economic resiliency. And um, today we will have three wonderful speakers. We will have Mr. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'm, call, I'm going to call them in the order that we have those speakers. But we have Mr. Jean Eugene Seroka, Executive Director of the Port of Los Angeles, uh, and we'll uh, just briefly now we'll get on screen, I believe, uh, his uh, uh, a bit of his resume. But I uh, advise you to read the resume carefully, his biographical notes, as he has uh, uh, experience uh, not only in in LA but but you know, he's been nominated uh, uh, for, by the Los Angeles major uh, and confirmed by the city of Los Angeles in 2014. And he has been outstanding, as you know, California in the global health crisis. And, uh, and he, uh, as the chief of America sport, he is responsible for managing more than $1.6 billion budget a year. And, 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 and with that is the logistics and the capital investments and the project. And so Mr. Soroka will in fact, be uh, uh, presenting today. Another presenter today uh, is Mr. Jonathan Daniels, uh, or JD, as I like to call him, because he, we share the same initials. And Jonathan is, is uh, now the chief executive uh, and port director of Port Everglades. And uh, he has, in, in addition, se held several posts related to both uh, uh, the maritime environment and, uh, and, and, and other types of, of jobs. And, and we look forward especially uh, JD on the um, uh, uh, sort of the cruise perspective, I think that, that you, you'll be able to enlighten us with that. Yes. And then finally, at, la at the end, but not, uh, last but not least, my co-national Miguel Angel Yanez Monroy, General Director of the Port Administration of Veracruz. Uh, and of course, uh, Miguel Angel has been in the port environment for uh, 35 years or longer. He's been the CEO uh, of several uh, uh, private sector companies and terminals in Mexico. And, and so we also look forward to that uh, uh, um, presentation from Miguel Angel. And so um, with that um, being, um, being said, and again, I know that in screen you have the full uh, bios of the participants, which I encourage you to read afterwards. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to our first presenter who uh, I believe um, is uh, JD, uh, Jonathan Daniels, 
from uh, the CEO and Port Director of Port Everglades. Uh, JD, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you. Jorge, thank you so much, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you to the uh, U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce uh, for putting this, uh, this session on, uh, the timeliness of this as we deal with a significant amount of, uh, of issues on, on a global basis. Uh, when you take a look at the diversity, whether we're in the Northeast, whether we're in the Southeast, uh, whether we're in Mexico, whether we're on the, on the West Coast, uh, we're all being impacted by by so many different uh, different issues. Now, I will say that, uh, and, this, and this is not a disclaimer, uh, I've been here for all of two weeks. Uh, came from the uh, from the U.S. Gulf Coast, uh, the Mississippi State Port Authority. Uh, so while I'm a little bit new to this position, a lot of the same issues uh, we dealt with uh, on the Gulf Coast, we deal with uh, at Port Everglades. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel with uh, with Gene and uh, and Miguel as as well, uh, my counterparts uh, in various parts of the world. And I think you're going to hear a little bit of a of a theme as to how we're keeping uh, as to how we're keeping cargo flowing, as to how we're keeping uh, people flowing uh, in some respects. Uh, and and I will talk a little bit about the cruise industry. And and while there's still the the no sale order uh, that's been issued, and we don't anticipate uh, to see that. Uh, see that lifted until at least the middle of September. I uh, will be able to talk a little bit about, uh, we see we have a little bit of a, of a day cruise operation uh, that has commenced operations uh, between uh, Port Everglades and the Bahamas. And we're using that, uh, that we don't have full directives. We're using that as a, as a little bit of a, of a catalyst uh, and, and a litmus test with how we see we're going to develop, we're going to clean, uh, we're going to maintain our terminals uh, and getting ready when the full-scale cruise industry uh, comes uh, comes back, we'll talk about that uh, certainly a little bit later. Uh, before I dive into some of those some of those issues, though, I do want to talk to you and those that don't know Port Everglades uh, very well. Uh, we are as diversified an operation uh, as there uh, as there comes. Uh, our trade with uh, our trade with Mexico uh, has uh, has been increasing as as of late, and we have uh, definitely with. Uh, with USMCA coming back online in the full force, uh, and uh, and even though we're still seeing issues associated with uh, with COVID, uh, we have direct uh, examples of the of the work uh, that we are doing. Uh, commerce still continues to flow, even though we are dealing with uh, with the issues associated with COVID. Uh, but if you look at the picture that uh, that's up there, uh, you should see uh, autos from Mexico that arrived uh, within the last week. Horizon Auto Logistics. Uh, and we've seen significant increases in our auto activity. We have not traditionally been a large uh, auto uh, uh, auto port, uh, but in the last uh, few years, we've seen that increase. Uh, we've welcomed this business, uh, and to have this type of short sea shipping uh, coming from uh, Mexico into the port with then distribution throughout South Florida uh, and elsewhere for us has been uh, has been awfully good, uh, awfully good to be able to see. Up until last week, uh, that terminal itself was was basically empty. Uh, there were a couple of cars here and there, a couple of autos uh, on the roll on roll off stage, but uh, for the most part, it was uh, it was an empty terminal. Uh, and when you consider that the plants had shut down in April due to COVID nineteen, there was really no production at all uh, in April or May, or very little uh, bit of that. But starting in the middle of June. Uh, the plants uh, reopened. Uh, they recovered a little bit. Uh, and again, you see about 1,300 GM autos uh, that landed at our port. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, really continued growth uh, during the, over the next few months. Uh, July and August will continue to be strong. Horizon anticipates about another 1,600 uh, units. Uh, all of this uh, is 100% uh, within our short sea uh, shipping activities. Uh, and those are coming th uh, from the cars and trucks are coming through Altamira uh, for sale in the United States. Now, this is really part of our overall uh, our overall trade lanes, which are extremely strong uh, for us. Uh, we are primarily in north south port when you consider South America, when you consider Central America. Uh, the majority of our activity uh, does uh, does move in those trade lanes. Uh, we do have strong movements as well into northern Europe. We have seen a little bit of a reduction of that uh, during the last few months, certainly with the slowdown uh, from COVID. Uh, but we are north and south. But for the most part, we have not been extremely strong into and out of the Mexican market. 
Uh, state of Florida, $7.1 billion in exports uh, in, in one of the last full years, and that's 2018 and 2019, 3.3 uh, specifically into the Mexican uh, market, 7.1 billion uh, in the USMCA uh, region uh, as a whole. So we certainly hope to be able to, uh, to see some additional growth. Uh, FEC, our intermodal, uh, our ICTF, uh, is actually uh, I, F, FEC, Florida East Coast Railroad, uh, is owned by Grupo Mexico uh, and, uh, and continues to be a large operator uh, for us. We certainly hope to be able to see uh, expansion of that uh, moving uh, well into the future. We'll also be able to talk a little bit about some of our expansion programs uh, that have been uh, that have been moving forward. And a lot of this is, anti is in anticipation, not only of increased growth, uh, into Central and South America, but into Mexico as a whole, you're taking a look at the Southport turning notch. Uh, you see the photo that's over on the right hand side is a recently completed phase one. Uh, and then the turning notch itself is a pretty expansive project, uh, about half a billion dollars, uh, which involves uh, the development of, of significant amount of new birth space, uh, dredging out and as well as a very, very significant uh, environmental program as well. Uh, where we had to replant and plant a brand new uh, mangrove area. Uh, and that allowed us the opportunity to get the go ahead to be able to do the Southport Turning Notch uh, expansion project. We're also going to bring bringing in three new ship to shore gantry cranes. They're the largest low profile cranes uh, that have ever been uh, constructed and manufactured in the United States. Uh, those will take to sea uh, in the next, uh, next, next few weeks and then arrive at some point in, uh, in mid-October. Uh, mid but you really take a look at, at the big picture of the automotive industry. And again, that's a lot of what we're, what we're looking at. In order to bring in the larger vessels, in order to bring in that additional cargo, we're really, we're looking at a deepening and widening project. This is a $509 million dredging, deepening and widening project. We do have a record of decision. Uh, we received a new start designation uh, last year, $29 million, which will, uh, which will take us through at least an initial phase of that. And what's interesting about that, it's in partnership with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, we actually have to reposition the U.S. Coast Guard, tear down their old uh, mooring basin and their boat basin, and allow us the opportunity to expand a, a what has been a very difficult uh, turning area for us, a very congested area uh, that has impacted not only our cargo operations, uh, but our cruise operations. When we have certain cruise vessels in there, uh, we cannot move uh, the large cargo vessels uh, through, uh, through into our Southport uh, area. Uh, but while we talk about the cruise, we talk about the activities associated with, uh, with our cargo operations, uh, really what was the impetus behind the dredging program uh, was our petroleum, and I'll talk about that and the expansion of that uh, in, the, in the not too distant future. Uh, the new logistics center uh, that's open and getting ready to be open full force. Uh, the Port Everglades International Logistics Center in partnership uh, with Centerpoint, uh, International Warehouse Services, IWS, uh, as part of their foreign trade zone activities, just began moving into the new logistics center. Uh, and we're looking forward to that being really a centerpiece uh, for, uh, for activities at the port, not only now, but moving into the future. Uh, being a large perishables port uh, as well, a significant amount of the movement through the port happens to be in the perishables market from Central uh, and South America. We're also working in partnership with a group that will be coming in and looking at establishing a brand new X-ray irradiation uh, facility. Rather than utilizing the old style bromide uh, systems uh, to be able to handle any type of uh, decontamination, uh, this allows us the opportunity to be able to come in, utilize state-of-the-art X-ray technology, and the utilization of that technology allows us the opportunity to very, very actively and aggressively uh, move through the containers. Uh, those that need the decontamination uh, and to be able to have everything be able to remove from them, uh, working with the private sector, allowing them the opportunity to come through, uh, move that through. Uh, it, it really is going to be a state-of-the-art uh, facility and one of the only port-based uh, irradiation facilities uh, in the United States. As well, I talked a little bit about our petroleum uh, activity. And again, while the containers uh, and the crews uh, really is a centerpiece of what we do here, uh, ultimately what we're doing is, is, is justifying a significant amount of that deepening and widening program uh, by our petroleum activities. We're the number two petroleum port uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, but when you really take a look at, uh, at the activity, 
uh, if you're going to fly, if you're going to drive in South Florida, you're going to you're going to be utilizing a product that comes through uh, Port Everglades. Uh, the jet fuel uh, we supply Miami International Airport, uh, our airport here in uh, Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood, as well as West Palm Beach, and a lot of the executive uh, activity in, in aviation. Uh, the jet fuel comes through uh, through our facility. Uh, and the opportunity to bring in the new Aframax uh, vessels, the larger vessels that are coming in here right now, uh, really do allow us the opportunity to, uh, uh, to move in the direction of being able to bring in that larger scale, get that economies of scale uh, associated by bringing in the larger vessels. So we look forward to, the, to that project. It is kicking off right now. We have brand new rack systems, piping systems that are going in, that are paving the way for the slip one widening uh, program. Uh, and ultimately, this is part of our of our deepening and widening project as well. And as I mentioned, was the imp the impetus behind uh, behind the Army Corps of Engineers uh, issuing the uh, the record of decision. So while we talk a little bit about the cruise, and this this will allow me the opportunity to move in the direction of uh, of talking about cruise and some of the safety uh, associated and the, and the healthcare uh, issues that we're dealing with right now. Uh, this is the Heron parking garage, and and if you can say that a parking garage is state of the art, uh, this is one. Uh, the utilization of uh, of moving walkways as well as solar systems. This is a hundred and twenty one million dollar project uh, that will be completed within the next uh, two months. Uh, it services uh, our Northport uh, cruise operations uh, and really provides us the opportunity to, uh, uh, to see a nice, a nice addition uh, to that. Again, it's going to be really state of the art, uh, the traffic flows and the way in which it was designed, uh, utilizing the latest technologies and traffic flows, uh, as well as touchless systems. Our parks system will allow the opportunity for someone to come in, not have to touch any type of, uh, any type of dispensing uh, system. You're not going to have to reach over, uh, grab the ticket. Everything can be handled uh, online. Everything can be handled uh, on the smartphone. So it's really going to provide uh, the latest technology uh, and allow us the opportunity to be able to move in a very, very different direction. Again, $121 million garage, 1,880 spaces. And that really moves into you know, talking about the, the combination of, of safety and security as well as attached to this uh, parking garage and in close proximity will be our convention center expansion uh, and hotel. Uh, it's north of that parking garage uh, area uh, and borders onto the intercoastal waterway. It allows for an expansion and the development of an 800 room uh, Omni Hotel. Uh, that is set to be able to open uh, in, uh, in 2023. Substantial completion should be late 2022, opening up in 2023. Uh, and it really points to the international uh, city uh, that Fort Lauderdale is and that Broward County is uh, as a whole uh, when you consider the cultural diversity, uh, but we have not had the type of consent convention center space to allow us the opportunity to bring in the large scale uh, shows that were necessary. You know, everybody knows us a lot for the uh, for the international boat show. This is going to be able to really take advantage of uh, of that diversity and allow us the opportunity to become a world class destination uh, for con uh, convention center activities. Again, I'll talk very very briefly about uh, about what we're doing uh, for uh, for safety, security, and really establishing a healthy corridor uh, on the port site. All of us have having uh, have been having to deal uh, with uh, with COVID and with the COVID crisis. Uh, We've been very fortunate. We've had a couple of issues. Uh, we're utilizing very advanced uh, contact tracing to make sure that we can minimize any type of impact uh, that's on the port. Uh, when you take a consideration of our cruise operations, our cruise operations have shut down. We're the third largest cruise port in the world. We handle about 3.9 million passengers uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and while we have opened up to the cruise industry, it's been a ferry operation between Fort Lauderdale uh, and the Bahamas, uh, Freeport and Bimini. And Bimini. Uh, that just commenced about two weeks ago. We're utilizing Terminal 21 as a prototype. Uh, we've got brand new cleaning procedures that have been put in place, splash guards, uh, the, uh, uh, the glass barriers and plexiglass uh, barriers that have been put up. Uh, we put pharma, uh, we've put pharmaceutical uh, vending machines uh, in place in order for you to be able to get into the terminal and get onto the vessel you must be wearing a mask. Uh, and if you happen to forget that as you're coming onto the terminal, you do have the opportunity, a last opportunity to be able to get that at one of our, our pharmaceutical uh, vending machines. We don't know ultimately what CDC is going to do. 
Uh, we're trying to anticipate as much as is possible and be able to put those practices in place. Again, we don't anticipate seeing any, uh, any vessels, any large scale bulk vessels, uh, whether it's Royal Caribbean, or whether it's Carnival, come back to the terminals until sometime in mid, uh, in, in mid September. Uh, so we're looking forward to being able to, uh, to move forward uh, on that. Uh, and with that, Jorge, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back over to you to hear from uh, my counterparts. Uh, thank you very much, JD. That was uh, uh, quite a, a whirlwind of information and tour of the forest there. Congratulations on a, on a well put uh, uh, presentation that, uh, you know, you, you addressed several, several issues, of course, you know, the infrastructure, the multi-million dollar investments that you're doing to improve operations on the port, which as we know is a multi-purpose port. And then the emphasis, of course, on, on the expansion, yet another venue in Southern Florida that will be happy to visit in, in one of our events once it's ready. So congratulations on that. I like the, you know, the sort of the, the vision and, and the medium term view on that. Uh, and um, and I, I'm sure that I have already a couple of questions for you uh, regarding stuff, but we're going to wait on the questions until the very end. Good. Until the very end of the... So thank you very much, JD. Great. I'm thank you, Jorge. Oh, thank you. We'll see you in a little bit. And uh, with that said, I am now going to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Eugene or Gene Siroca, uh, CEO uh, uh, from the Port of Los Angeles, who will, of course, address some of the similar, some of the same issues as JD has had. But of course, the LA uh, Port being uh, uh, different and different characteristics. I'm sure we'll get that view. So Eugene, without further ado, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. And in two weeks, JD, uh, I think you did a pretty darn good job. Well done. Good afternoon and buenas tardes. It's great to be part of this webinar today and address our good friends in Mexico and those here in the U.S. working to keep trade flowing between our two nations. It is the work of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce that brings our two great nations together in a cooperative spirit of collaboration. In times like we're experiencing now, being able to work with one another is more important than ever. Once a week, our head of public safety and Port Police Chief Tom Gazy flies a drone around our 7,500 acres of property and 43 miles of waterway to take a look and make sure that everything is moving as we have designed. All terminals are open and have been so since the emergency orders here in the United States, California and Los Angeles came down in early March. As you can see from our terminal tarmacs, we have room to grow when the American economy is ready to reemerge and reopen as part of our recovery economically from COVID-19. This also gives us a unique vantage point to take a look at our ship work, rail and truck connectors, and all the efforts we have taking place on the ground. And should we need to address the situation, we have that good vantage point to be able to jump in right away. Today, for example, we have 10 container vessels at port, one being idle, which is not so unusual these days. It's about the same as we would normally see at this time of year. We also have one tanker in port, but nine tankers outside at Anchorage. And our vast port facility, including that of our neighbor here in the San Pedro Bay Port Complex, were designed just for this unintended event in particular. And as you can imagine, with most of us at home working or telecommuting past the winter season in the Midwest and up and East Coast. And with our LAX airport at about 95% reduction in flights, we have limited storage capability left. So these tankers are awaiting instruction, whether they go to Long Beach, Los Angeles, or even up bay to our Chevron facility in El Segundo. We have a couple of cruise ships in, including the Nat Geo cruise ship. Most of these uh, hours spent in harbor are to get stores and make sure the limited crew is uh, well informed on what the next steps are going to be, as well as have provisioning on, uh, on board. As I mentioned, all terminals are open. Some gates are closed, just depending on the volume of traffic for a shift either during the day or the evening, but by and large remain operable as per normal schedules. A look at our numbers through the month of May show us here in Los Angeles down about 19% year to date. And with the inclusion of our neighboring port, we're down about 13%. 
So the cargo decline we're witnessing right now rivals that of the Great Recession in a gateway that accounts for 40% of the United States imports. Any notion of talking about a recovery in our industry is just a bit early right now, but we are moving cargo to the tune of about 80 to 85% of normal. And with 50 million Americans out of work today due to the double hit of both the trade policies in Washington and the shuttering of the American economy by COVID-19, I'll take that for right now. But please know that less cargo through America's port means fewer jobs. And just to that point, we've not only seen these two major shocks to the supply chain, which have caused uncertainty, but also manufacturing shifts moving out of China to Southeast and Southeast Asia nations, which allow for an easier cargo routing scheme through the Suez Canal to less expensive, less reg regulated East Coast ports. As China began increasing their production output, the U.S.'s demand began to fall so precipitously where we now see the impacts to our overall GDP that will be historic. But overall, the work that's being done now to move critical goods and those of the critical retail variety continue. In our seven other lines of business, our visitor serving and programmatic activities have been shut down since early March, and all other lines of trade business are down in negative territory. Automobiles have been hampered to the point where we here in the United States will probably buy about 12 million new cars and trucks, which also rivals what we witnessed during the recession. Scrap metal and steel have been hit so hard by these ill-advised tariffs. Petroleum, as I had discussed, based on a waning demand, continue to stockpile. And as JD mentioned, the cruise business is completely gone at this point in time. And while we've been encouraged by the leaders of the cruise industry, gathering around with subject matter experts in the healthcare field, private equity, and other domain, it's going to be some time, we believe, until the cruise business begins to find its way into the future. Our fruit season, primarily from the west coast of Latin America, finished its season unimpeded this year, and we look forward to starting up again during the next harvest in November and December. Mexico is our 19th largest trading partner, and while traditionally the work here has been cross-border either via rail or truck, we have found a niche operating business to run cargo north and south across the Pacific. More than $1 billion in trade is taking place right now. And please remember our, our other business, some of it indirect running to Maquila areas, is also of great importance to us with the new USMCA agreement that replaced NAFTA and an opportunity, we believe, to welcome new trade ideas with one of our greatest trading partners in Mexico. For all that's been discussed around the waning demand in the United States, we've seen liner shipping companies simply cancel sailings. In the beginning of the year for the first quarter, we saw about 25% of the ships normally intended to come here to Los Angeles canceled. That was a little bit less in the second quarter, and we're seeing very, very small numbers in the months of July and August, hopefully showing that the market can balance out supply and demand. And at the same time, while the air freight market has been dominated by space constraints and higher prices, Zim has introduced a new service from South China directly to Los Angeles in 12 days to try to capitalize on that marketplace that needs certainty, especially within the omni-channel distribution network. All of this has impact on jobs. And here in Southern California, one in nine jobs are tied to this port complex through our five county area. And that means that during relatively normal times, more than 1 million people go to work every day with a job related to this port. LA County boasts the largest manufacturing employee base in the country with more than 390,000 people going to work every day building products right here locally. And nationwide, we account for about 3 million jobs. The cargo that traverses our port reaches each and every one of our 435 congressional districts. This truly is a conversation of national significance. 
On the jobs front, with our longshore labor contingents, our shift work is down 18% year over year compared to 2019. What's encouraging as this number continues to move is that the loss of labor jobs is not outpacing the loss of container business. That's also shown in our all important three year average where jobs are down 10%. It's important to look at this because it does take into account a large sample size that predates the tariff policies from Washington. In all, these are the new ground rules and the new terrain for us to do business and trade at the Port of Los Angeles. We're not going to sit back and complain. It's my belief that we will have to reinvent ourselves. In addition to the market losses we have faced since the unfortunate labor lockout of year 2002 and some heavy environmental regulations that began in 2006, we will lose an additional 15% of our import cargo because of these trade policies and the shifting manufacturing landscape in Asia. That gives us a unique opportunity, in particular to focus on exports, specifically agriculture and forestry products, manufacturing broadly, the automotive sector and its tiered suppliers. And while we'll chase every import container we can in the Trans-Pacific Theater, this may just give us a chance to balance our trade a little bit better than we've been known for in the past, potentially lowering our cost to serve and making us a more attractive trade gateway for logistics decision makers, a focus on round trip and triangulated economics to remove cost from our system. If I'm right, this will bring longshore, truckers, logistics, and rail partners back to work sooner. Thus, our business imperatives are number one. I have called for a nationwide port community system, one that can give the exporter in the United States a clear vantage point through a single pane of glass as to where containers may be located to pair up with truck and rail services, along with international vessel sailing schedules. The look of this work will be based specifically on an open architecture with milestones and credit based on the physical movement of cargo and what the cargo owner needs to see. Standards that can be set across the industry and the ability for competition, but realistically allowing the cargo owner to find the best path to reconnect with their customers and find emerging markets is the goal of this nationwide system. I've also put together for the first time a West Coast coalition of business interests to answer the question of port competitiveness. This all-star cast includes all five West Coast container ports, the Employers Association of the PMA, the lobbying group of the Pacific Merchant Shippers Association, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union up and down the West Coast of the United States, and also including across the table from each other, the two Western railroads. And while their focus as a collective will be to strengthen U.S. exports, they too will find all opportunities possible to bring folks back to work. And it may include further cross-border activities and north-south traffic with our neighbors in Mexico. Here at the Port of Los Angeles, we will continue to invest through this downturn of an economic cycle. Through our strong financial policies over the past five years, we have the ability to invest more than $367 million over the next cycle in construction projects of both our physical and digital infrastructures, as well as our visitor serving area. This in turn will keep 3,000 construction workers on the job over the next 12 months. And if we can do all this and earn more cargo, that will mean more jobs here at the Port of Los Angeles. If that's not enough, on March 31st, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti named me to be the city's first chief logistics officer in Los Angeles. This job to be held along with my current role as port director. And the goal here was as a response to COVID-19, linking our medical service providers and other critical workers with the necessary protective equipment they need to do their jobs every day. Immediately, we stood up what is now essentially a new city department here in Los Angeles, created a website and platform called Logistics Victory Los Angeles and the lovela.org website came into being. 
it's a marketplace of sorts that can match up those who have critical supplies for our medical and critical frontline workers with those who make, manufacture, and distribute them. If there are PPE manufacturers in Mexico that the membership can bring towards us, please do so. And we encourage those folks who have an interest in working with U.S. hospitals here in the L.A. area to sign up at our website, lovela.org, and see how we can put you together with those frontline hospitals. I've been so heartened, first, by leveraging our great relationships that we've had in the industry. And you see some iconic names here who have stepped up and donated supplies, time, and expertise to this worthy cause of bringing personal protective equipment to our frontline workers. And I'm extremely heartened by shipping giant, CMA CGM, who answered our call with some 200,000 face masks and delivered at the time of need for Mayor Garcetti to announce publicly that this partnership would continue on and into the future, not just on the port side of our business, but helping the great people of Los Angeles and its workforce. At the same time, with a small group of volunteers, including people like David Libatik, Avin Sharma, and Erica Calhoun, we embraced on direct manufacturer relationships and started that with the iconic American company, the Honeywell Corporation. And we designed an agreement in record time for 24 million of these all important N95 respirator masks to be delivered to the city of Los Angeles over a 24 month period. While others were looking to overseas partners that were not necessarily proven in this marketplace, we found a company just six hours down the 10 freeway that had given us a commitment of delivery schedules over 24 months at a price point no one could earn. And at the same time, what we pay for these masks, we turn around and deliver to our hospitals. There is no markup and no margin. This is a service of the city of Los Angeles that in part brought some 500 furloughed factory workers back on the job in Phoenix, Arizona. And that direct relationship will continue with manufacturers. All of this work is underpinned by information technology. Utilizing our nation's only port community system, the Port Optimizer, we built a plug-in now known as the Medical Optimizer, which follows the order cycle process initially from hospital demand signals on supplies all the way through the order cycle process to fulfillment. This execution platform also takes into account greater visibility and exception management protocol to manage the most particular of supply chains. And that port optimizer is something very unique to the United States. While folks in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe have been using port community systems for decades, here in the U.S. we've lagged in this area. But we formed a partnership with Wabtec, the former General Electric Transportation Company, to build in on top of a great partnership with United States Customs that gives us visibility before vessels leave Asia and allows us the time necessary to distribute information across the spectrum of port community partners, railroads, terminal operators, trucking companies, and the all important BCOs to make better decisions and make better use of the efficiencies of operations by having this information earlier upstream than most would have. And with all of this, while we're trying to look after our health and the safety of our businesses, I can report to you that we've not taken our eye off the ball of our core business. And I'll end my presentation with a very special video on the Mediterranean Shipping Company's call of the Isabella. I am so pleased to announce a new world record that has been set right here at the Port of Los Angeles. In coordination with the Mediterranean Shipping Company and the great women and men of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, locals 13, 63, and 94, 
APM terminals at Pier 400 processed 18,465 containers on and off the MSC Isabella. This represents the most container lifts ever for a single vessel call and 1,385 containers more than the previous record. In all, 34,263 TEUs were moved across the dock. It is quite an accomplishment. Special thanks to the Los Angeles port pilots who skillfully navigated the arrival and departure of this mega ship. The Isabella is among the largest in the world, part of a new class of 23,000 plus TEU sustainable container ships. The MSC Isabella is named after the eldest daughter of MSC USA President and CEO Fabio Santucci. It was the Isabella's maiden call at a North America port. We take great pride in hosting this special vessel here in Los Angeles. This achievement continues to show that the Port of Los Angeles is big ship steady and can adeptly handle these increasingly larger vessels. We applaud this record setting effort of our ILWU workforce and the great people of APM terminals and MSC who put their trust in the Port of Los Angeles to carry out this cargo move milestone. As always, more cargo means more jobs here at America's Port. Great, and that concludes my update for this afternoon. Back to you, Jorge. Wow, well, Gene, thank you very, very much for that, uh, another Tour de Force presentation. Uh, uh, congratulations, seriously, on everything that, that you and the port, the community are doing. Uh, before moving on, I'd just like to point out uh, a couple of things that, that, that really sparked, uh, sparked my, my interest, my attention. You could not say it more times, uh, Gene, that more cargo means more jobs. And that one in, in every five, at least in your uh, immediate area, one of every five jobs is somehow uh, directly to the port operation. And that is, I believe, something that all the ports uh, participating today share which is the impact to their, to their local community and the importance of port city relations. And, and, and again, here, kudos to you with the, uh, with the Love LA, uh, the whole uh, idea of, of doing this for not only the COVID, but, but later on, I think is very worthwhile. Congratulations on, uh, to the mayor and congratulations to you on, on the appointment. Uh, I think that, that the philosophy that the, the, the Port of LA has about taking this crisis as an opportunity about resiliency and innovation, about opening new markets uh, beyond the containers in order not to depend heavily on that is, is again, very uh, worthwhile. And then uh, finally, your mention of the, uh, of the port opt optimizer. L like you correctly point out, you know, uh, uh, port community systems are abundant in, in Europe and Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean are both moving towards that direction. Uh, and as I'm sure uh, you know, and, and, and with the trade with the, the West Coast of Latin America, but again, it is important that we uh, acknowledge the, uh, the U.S. port optimizer that, can, that is, uh, you know, uh, at, a, at a national level. So again, uh, Gene from the Port of Los Angeles, thank you very much for a most interesting presentation. And uh, I will now turn it to uh, Miguel Angel, who, of course, is the uh, Director General of the um, Autoridad Portuaria Integral de Veracruz, or the Api Veracruz, as is uh, known. Uh, uh, Miguel Angel is going to uh, now give us a perspective from the uh, uh, south of the border, from one of the Mexican ports uh, that trades uh, with Europe and the United States. So with that, Miguel Angel, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the United States-Mexico Chamber of Commerce for this opportunity and this invitation, where we'll present first the, from the central perspective of the federal government, what is the policy that we are following in order to develop the port and maritime sector, and then how important is the Veracruz port in, as an anchor point for this, um, for, for this strategy. So allow me to share my presentation. 
here. Now, um, I would like to start first by, hold up. Um, hold on. Good. I got it. Uh, first, by explaining real quick, what is the, 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 the situation today of Mexico with regards to foreign trade with, uh, with respect to what happens uh, worldwide with uh, foreign trade? As you know, 90% of the value of world trade is carried out by sea. However, in Mexico, despite its privileged strategic location, it's only 70% of foreign trade basically goes north and and southbound uh, by land, mainly by truck, a little bit less by railroad, and only 31% of the cargo is transported by sea, notwithstanding, as I said, the advantage of strategic position that we have uh, worldwide. Uh, part of this is due to over the last 30 uh, years or more, there has been a lack of a public policy aimed to, to promote merchant marine and shipbuilding in, in the country, as well as uh, uh, another effect that has to do basically with attending the, the foreign train uh, to the North American region due to the, 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 the treats that we signed with, with that region. But um, of, the, of the whole uh, trade, only 262 million tons are moved by Mexico in, in the Mexican ports with uh, with, with the ships that have uh, a Mexican flag, only 0.2%, and most of it is mineral products or hydrocarbon products. Um, uh, going inside, on another issue is that uh, over the last 30 years, we have focused on developing the northern part of the country, um, the, what we call it the Mexican Altiplano, the highlands mainly because of the investments that have been established in that region. Uh, but if you look at worldwide, 55% of the world population lives in the coastal area. Moreover, uh, two thirds of the cities uh, in the world with more than 1.5 million uh, people are located in the coastal areas. So basically what the government is proposing is reord uh, establish a reorder state by uh, modifying the marginalization levels of the coastal regions, and particularly to start including in the south southeast region in the trend of development of the country. Uh, the way to do that is that we are developing a strategy for coastal port intermodal systems where we're grouping the, 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 the ports in by regions uh, that can serve to common areas inland, and from there to try to take the, the success of some of the ports like Veracruz, and to expand that to the, the to the success, our success to other regions that need uh, further development, and also to to create um, uh, the, a strategy to promote the merchant marine and the naval industry in Mexico. So. With all this, what we're planning is to contribute to a better balance in regional uh, development to promote private, public, and social investment in different types of activities related with the core business, such as industrial parks, logistic platforms, power plants, or dry ports, among others. Also, to improve the efficiency of, and competitiveness of supply chains inside the country and generate a greater supply of coastal and regional employment. And finally, we need the promotion of education programs with focus on port and maritime activities. Um, another uh, issue with regards to promoting the, the, the maritime industry has to do with the, the reactivation of the, merchant mar the Mexican merchant marine and the naval industry. It, this has been uh, divided in two phases. The first phase includes the the, the promotion and establishment of new maritime routes that can run uh, parallel to the, to the coastline of our country in what we call it maritime highways in, in order to provide cabotage and short sea shipping. This short sea shipping can reach up to Central America, the Caribbean, 
And of course, like in the case of the Gulf of Mexico to the smaller ports of Florida or the, uh, of the states um, that are not of the country, but uh, neighboring the Gulf of Mexico. And we have set up certain goals uh, to be accomplished by the end of 2004, when ends this, uh, this particular um, uh, Yes. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, I see that perhaps you want to click the button for, for the presenter for the presentation to be blown up and really big because we're seeing it as, as the presenter. Oh. So we have the two slides and we're not reading all of the text. Uh, I don't know if you could just blow it up to uh, presentation mode instead of. We tried so many times. I don't know what happened. To well, if it's YouTube. too, if it's if it's a, a big uh, a deal, then then forget about it. I also no, like. No, no, no. It's to, uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Great. So I'm sorry about that. So we have uh, specific goals to be accomplished by the end of 2004 when this federal administration ends. Um, basically. Uh, one of the most important is that we are trying to increase the participation of the maritime transport um, with re regards to the, the, the total movement of cargo in the country from 31% that is today to 38%. We pretend to, to reduce uh, logistic costs um, due to the cargo movement by $3 billion uh, every year by that time. And of course, to increase the participation of the maritime transport from 0.1% of the GDP to 0.5% um, uh, total. Now, how is Veracruz um, participating in this whole strategy? Well, Veracruz, to start with, um, has a huge hinterland that connects to the North American region, to the South American region, Europe, and Africa. Uh, um, and this is through the Atlantic Ocean. And um, if you look really into the country, Veracruz has been for many years the main maritime gateway of Mexico. Uh, Veracruz uh, has a hinterland, an inland hinterland that reaches 15 states. And these states concentrate 7 million people and represent 60% of the GDP, uh, covering uh, the total amount of states, one fifth of our territory. If, we look even more into the port. Uh, since 2014, we've been uh, involved in a quite ambitious expansion uh, program that includes uh, the, the development of an area in the North Bay. Uh, and this port area is going to be, when finished, twice as big as what used to be the, 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 the port of Veracruz as we knew it in the South Bay. And uh, when we look at the port capacity, um, by the end of 2018, we were operating at full capacity, which is about 30 million tons, and the total throughput in tons was um, 29 million. And when the opening of the first terminals in, in, in this year, we will be able to reach uh, 45 million tons in capacity and by the conclusion of phase one of the, of the expansion, we will be able to double that port capacity. But in looking the whole uh, development uh, uh, pro project, we should be able to, to triplicate, to, to increase by three times the capacity of the port. And this will give us basically a project for another 100 years, considering that the port today has 100 years of uh, history uh, as it is and as we know it today. Furthermore, looking at uh, inland next to the North Port area, the, the expanded area, we can gain it uh, 400 hectares of land acquired and some claim. And this is going to be uh, signed for the development of an industrial logistics zone. And you start to see how all this is going to start uh, creating an opportunity for employment and for development and for participation of new business in, in the region. Mm, looking at the logistic bay, it is really a very relevant uh, aspect of our uh, development plan because it has the, the flexibility for the, the installation of new companies related to logistic and ports. And it could be uh, from uh, 
any type of, um, of added value industry, or it could be also any, uh, any advanced industry, like um, it, it is considered in the Maquila areas as we can work as a free trade zone, or we can also work as a free industrial park uh, area. Uh, basically, we are trying to set different business schemes and we have leasing contracts quite open that goes from three years up to 20 years and the opportunity to double that period in order to provide cert legal certainty to the investors that we have done in, in, in the port. When, as all of you uh, and my colleagues already explained, we have been uh, facing this pandemic uh, uh, condition. And uh, for, the, for the port of Veracruz, as it is for all the ports in Mexico, our main challenge has been to attend the, this pandemic uh, while continuing commercial and port activities since the ports were declared by the federal government as an essential center of our national nation's economy. Um, so what that means is that we have to provide business continuity uh, to the community. And for, to do that, we have to maintain the efficiency in the port operations for both vessels and terminals, maintain also the, the, the efficiency in cargo transit, inbound and outbound. And it, and it was a good opportunity to strengthen digital procedures by the port community considering that the port community is all, uh, all the, the, the vessel companies, all the port operators, uh, custom agents, authorities, and everyone works in a, pla in, in a common platform and they have to work furthermore in order to avoid it, uh, interaction between all the, the staff outside. And all that was in order to provide safety and health for our people and to protect the, the, the condition of our, of our goods. And yes, we have, have some impacts. In fact, by the end of uh, this, this month, uh, June, previous month, we have had already a reduction in the total throughput of 9%. And some of the main industries have been more affected, like the, the car industry. Now, Veracruz has been considered one of the, of, of the largest ports handling uh, Finnish vehicles. And the last year and the previous year, we've been handling on, in the order of 1 million Finnish vehicles. And uh, this, this year, uh, up to the first six month period, we have a decrease of 50%, mainly because also, as you know, the, the, the cluster areas of, of Mexico where there are the main assembly plants is stopped for two months production. Now, just to, to, to wrap up, what it is for us after the, the pandemic? Well, we need to continue with our business uh, at a fast pace. Um, as in Port of uh, Everglades, we two months ago uh, started the operations of a new bar garage uh, that has the capacity for 10,000 uh, finished vehicles. And now we have four new terminals in the expansion area that need to be opened by the end of the, of the year. In fact, within the next 60 days, we have to open two of the terminals, the oil and fuel terminal, and the, the, the grain bulk terminal, all automated and specialized. Uh, since two are already in operation, the container terminal of Hutchison Ports and the uh, mineral uh, terminal, of the Grupo Logra, Mexican um, company from the Yucatan region. We need to continue guaranteeing the safety of people and we need to, to, to do a very intense promotion of new capitals and short sea shipping services that have just opened in the, in the area in the middle of the pandemic by the Mexican groups Griever and Baja Ferry. Um, and they are going to, to navigate along the Gulf of Mexico, and one of them, River, is going to reach Central America and the Caribbean. And uh, also, we will continue uh, to uh, our interest in the offer of digital procedures through the port community. Uh, now we are developing more business intelligence applications through our uh, digital platform, Mediport, 
we are quite advanced already in blockchain uh, uh, methods in order to create certain processes within a very secure uh, uh, digital platform. Uh, we will continue promoting new businesses in the industrial logistic uh, area. And finally, all these, as I say, generate uh, taking care of, of, of the well-being in the environment and, and the region uh, has to be a big employment uh, uh, area, a big employment generation trigger uh, area. And that's what I have about the, the, the this. And we have a small video. And if uh, someone, uh, uh, Clementine or someone can help me to present the video, I would appreciate it. Uh, there is no sound in there, but you can see the the, the expansion area does the fluids or fuel terminal. Then in the middle is a multi-purpose terminal that is going to be also under development. Then there is the container terminal of Hutchison Ports in the first stage, and the second stage is going to have another uh, period uh, position. Then there is the break, um, the the grain and the and the mineral bulk terminals. The the depth in the port, 15.5 meters, with the possibility to go up to 20 meters. Um, in the plant, there is a second container terminal, more terminal for uh, commercial operations. We also develop an area to regulate the the truck transport before entering the the, the port. And as I mentioned, the, the logistic based industrial park. We develop also a 20 kilometer uh, railway bypass by Santa Fe uh, to Santa Fe area. And it's unique in, in the port because the two uh, main railways, Ferromex and uh, through Ferrosur in the, in, the, in the region and Kansas City, southern of Mexico will operate in the, in the port and be able to compete. And that's the second phase for future years, uh, which uh, is the plan for the, for the next 10, 10 years after 2024. And that's it very much what we have in, in the port up to today. Thank you. Uh, again, Miguel Angel, thank you very much. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, one of the things that's very impressive about, uh, about the Api Veracruz is this in, in enormous investment and in the expansion that you just uh, kindly uh, shown us. And of course, this expansion means, uh, you know, more growth and, and more growth means more jobs and economic development. Again, very important, the port city relationship and where Veracruz and uh, along with all the Mexican ports have in, implemented in terms of safety protocols because ports are considered the safe, uh, essential workers uh, for the Mexican government. They never closed, they, they were open and, uh, and yet infection rates uh, are, are low to non-existent thanks to the early uh, protocols that uh, all, the, all of the region's ports uh, uh, took. So thank you very much, uh, Miguel Angel, uh, for uh, that presentation. Uh, we, we do have a, a few uh, uh, questions uh, uh, around here. And so um, I'm going to, if it's all right with the panelists, I'm gonna ask you all to activate your camera so that we're uh, uh, all on screen here. And I have uh, uh, picked out some questions and, and there is a question, uh, I'll, I'll start in no or order. I believe this is for the Port of, uh, of LA. Our first question uh, for, for Jean. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make uh, two questions in one, Gene, and that way we'll kill two birds with one stone. The first question, Gene, is what do you think is the best way to work together 
amongst these three great ports that we've just uh, had the presentations on to increase trade between Mexico and the United States, which after all is the name of the game of, of the US-Mexico uh, Chamber of Commerce. So the first one is, what is your idea on how to increase trade between Mexico and the US? And the second one, uh, it, it calls a little more for your vision on, on, on what your predictions would be with trade with Asia, particularly with China, by end of the year, you know, given that you said that things are getting back to normal and that the percentage of calls or vessels uh, that you expect are very low. What, what, uh, what are your, your thoughts on that and what uh, uh, ports are leading indicators of economic activity? So if the port is doing good, we'll, we'll, we'll go and, 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 and guess that the economy is doing good. So Gene, if you could take these questions, I will uh, take some time to prepare the questions for the other presenters. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jorge. Well, it just comes to mind in listening to both JD and Miguel Aniel that there are great opportunities. And while it may not be a direct relationship on the physical movement of cargo between our ports, the common ground that we have and the expansion opportunities all of our ports have presented just get the mind going in what we could do. You know, with JD's background, whether it was in Gulfport or Baton Rouge or Maine, he knows a lot of folks. The same thing when uh, Miguel Aniel came here to Los Angeles to visit, we talked a lot about digitization. We had some friends in common. And here from the state side, knowing what an important trading partner Mexico is to the US, how can we really pick that to the next level? So I think one of the easy answers would be for us three to kind of keep in touch and blend some of these ideas together. Maybe it's with our individual networks overlapping and how folks can have a great interest in building these three ports together. On the, uh, the notion of China, uh, my projection right now is that the Port of Los Angeles volume will be down overall by about 20% when we hit the end of the year. Uh, China will probably drop faster than that. Uh, they make up about 55% of all of our trade on the freight side. So we'll probably decline by, I'm thinking right now, about 25% in our business with China. The difficult thing is that for every new container we earned, from a Southeast or South Asian Asia, uh, Asia country, we lost three containers out of China. So that's part of what I said why I believe we have to reinvent ourselves. And it's not a partisan discussion around US politics, it's just fact in the numbers. And if we have to focus a little bit more on exports, maybe it's a triangulated uh, concept, especially with Maquilas, that we could become a, a deeper trading partner in, I'd be open to those types of discussions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gene, for, for, for your answer. We, uh, I, I don't know if any of the other two uh, panelists, given that, that the question calls for the involvement of all three ports, have anything to add to, to, your, to your answer. Please go ahead, uh, Miguel Angel, and then JD, if you have anything. And then while you answer that, I will uh, I'll pick up another question. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Jorge. Uh, last year, when we visited the port of LA uh, and I had the opportunity to speak to Gene, we mentioned the possibility of um, of understanding each other of what was going on in blockchain and in port community. We, by the way, took some good recommendations uh, by you for the conclusion of the development of this railroad corridor and what we needed to do in order to manage properly competition between two big railroad monsters in, at least for us in Mexico, they are the two big uh, monsters in your country is Union Pacific and Santa Fe Railway, uh, Burlington uh, BNSF, but uh, the same condition and, and you had some particular interest on how we were uh, capturing so much volume on cars, we hopefully will recover that volume because uh, the assembly plants are starting to produce back again. And as soon as the world starts to, to, to demand vehicles, these hopefully will come back to the, to, to the port because we have all the facilities and the services in place. We have done a lot of things on, um, on flexible services for our all main customers, the owners of the cargo. We have direct inter interaction in the port with the with the end customers, like Volkswagen in the assembly plant in the assembly plants of for car in the car industry. We have direct uh, dialogue with them 
in order to understand what their needs are inside the port and, uh, uh, and not just depend on what's happening with the terminal operator. So if we can exchange all that experience between uh, our ports, I think that would be uh, great. And for Ever, uh, uh, Port of Everglades, I believe there is a big opportunity in Mexico with this new strategy of establishing maritime highways because it's going to include the short sea shipping for certain products. I mean, like cars is something that is already uh, well established in, in our country. But uh, for example, fruits and other products is something that we can uh, trade uh, easily between ports. And I believe we have a lot uh, that we can do with that port as well. Thank you, Miguel Angel. JD? Yes, Miguel. Uh, certainly, I'd, I'd like to extend an invitation actually to both of you. Uh, if you have not been to, uh, to Port Everglades, certainly uh, certainly love to be able to bring you over here. Yeah, Gene, and you, you pointed to to an issue, and, and I think you know the, the fact that all three of us being together uh, on on this uh, on this call, I think, is is very important. You look at ports, though we are competitive, and oftentimes we're in a hyper competitive environment. We really look at ourselves as a system. Uh, how do we take advantage from point to point to allow us the opportunity to establish trade lanes to take advantage of the strength uh, that you have in uh, that you have in, in LA? Uh, regionally, you know, what you have, uh, what you have, and allows us the opportunity to establish some type of system of short sea shipping between our between our two ports. Uh, we're, we're not sitting here, and especially during this time with 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 the global crisis of, of COVID, where all of the economies around the world, we need to look at better ways and under which we can uh, partner, we can participate. Uh, I, I think as well, you take a look at what's going on within our three facilities. Well, oftentimes the revenues are, are tight. We still need to engage in maintaining our capital programs. We still need to be able to expand. We still need to be able to bring in the equipment, the efficiencies that are necessary. And now with the, the lucky part of what we do have going on is, is a little bit in some of our terminals, we don't have the level of congestion that we typically have to deal with during these construction projects. We're fortunate to be able to isolate down some of our capital expenditures and some of our capital program now and the construction programs into some areas of our port that are not as busy. It allows us the opportunity to accelerate programs, accelerate construction, get these projects done quicker. And then when, when the economy does come back and when the shipping activities does, does come back, we get the opportunity to unleash these programs and these projects uh, into, they're, they're going to be basically just in time and ready uh, for that next go around. You know, Gene, you talk about certainly the impacts that you see regionally. You talk about the impacts of, of China. You know, overall, year over year, we're going to be probably down about 25 percent. Uh, and a lot of that happens because of the impacts that we've seen in our Caribbean nations with our Caribbean partners and down into Central America. They, they are tourism and hospitality based and a lot of the goods and services that we get involved with back and forth end up feeding into those areas. So we're hitting it, we're seeing those impacts on two sides. One is our cargo flows are down, though because we are strong in the perishables market, uh, we do need to be able to get, uh, get those products in, get them into the consumption zone of South Florida. But at the same time, it hits us on the secondary por portion and that's because the shutdown in the cruise industry. Uh, is those nations that are typically utilizing our goods and services down in those areas, not only are not only taking those, the cargo, they're also missing out on taking the passengers uh, into those markets as well. But I look forward to being able to work with, uh, with my two counterparts uh, and the opportunity again, to really strengthen our system as a whole. Let me unmute myself. Thank you, uh, all three for uh, your participation and for these questions uh, or answers to these questions. Uh, again, I think that this is, it's vital. There are questions that uh, some of them are, are directed to uh, Miguel Angel. Uh, and, and before I ask those, uh, which are uh, a very particular, I'd ra rather ask uh, uh, your opinion, uh, gentlemen, on, on, on a more, uh, on two types of, call, two, two questions. Uh, the first is, is, is security related. And, uh, and, 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 and obviously in the pandemic, there have been as both uh, JD and J actually all three of you made a point of the digital uh, uh, world and the reliance or not over reliance, but increased reliance on digital uh, frameworks and digital platforms in order to conduct trade safely and in order to. So in that sense, uh, what security measures uh, would you 
would you uh, take to ensure secure lines of trade between US, Mexico and ports and dry ports? And that's an interesting twist to the question, the dry port part. I think that uh, security uh, protocols have been in place in, in both uh, countries or all countries to make trade safe, but there's a question for you to, to address. And then if, if, if you may, uh, along and tight, tight along with that one is once the COVID pandemic is over, whenever this is, let's hope it's soon, but let's look at 2021 as, as a year where uh, strategies are in place, uh, enough PPEs are going on, uh, uh, you know, wearable uh, the technology, uh, uh, you know, the, the temperature gauges, cameras, the, all of these things have been implemented in order for us to more or less uh, uh, live uh, to a somewhat normal, normal, normal life. And if that or when that happens, how do you intend your port operations to to be. This will be a new normal. So anybody's guess is, is as good. So uh, on the one hand, we, you got that security question on, on how do you make the sort of ship port interface secure in terms of, of the COVID uh, and in terms of national security. And, uh, and then how do you see your ports getting back to a new normal, uh, uh, let's say in 2021? Uh, and the and the order it it doesn't matter but we can have uh, like, let's try J D Jean Miguel Angel this time around and then I'll ask Miguel Angel a specific question that I have here for you. So it's interesting because we talk about we talk about the safety we talk about the the healthy corridor that we try and establish between our our gates uh, and into our terminals and then you talk about about safety or you talk about security as well they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, the fact that we have we have the partnership certainly under the under the Department of Homeland Security and the federal guidelines that are mandated, uh, but our agreements that we have with the with the Broward Sheriff's Office uh, in maintaining the safety and security, uh, and, and here's one where, where certainly you take a look at, at they have to be able to work together. Uh, if in this, and with it within and certainly probably everybody saw what happened with uh, with our cruise operation here. Uh, with uh, with some of our lines that came in, the vessel was trying to ultimately trying to get uh, uh, to get home, get to their get to their port, and get people off. Uh, but it's even something that happens today when there is a call that comes into to the sheriff's office that comes into our our safety and security zone. Uh, we had to we had to respond just the other day uh, to a situation where we were not getting the proper information. Uh, we had an ambulance uh, with the, the sheriff's office uh, that ended up going out to, uh, to visit that vessel. Uh, what started out as, as, a, uh, as a diabetic issue ended up being a COVID issue. Uh, and the information was not properly provided. Uh, so ultimately, any time that they're going out and having to deal with that type of situation, uh, you have to respond. You have to make sure that the safety is there, that they're, they're, the health care providers are, are providing that, uh, that service. But at the same time, it ends up taking that, uh, that ambulance, it takes that team out of the rotation uh, for a period of time. So the way in which we end up backfilling, the way in which we make sure that we don't miss a beat with our, with our safety uh, response as well as our security response, uh, and we have a very layered approach associated with that. There's very active uh, security and there's some passive security. Uh, but the one thing that we can never uh, let go of the fact of is that, is that we're living in a world right now uh, where there are people that are, are, are trying to, uh, uh, to do harm. Uh, and within that, we cannot let down on the approach under which uh, we maintain the safety and security. Certain, certain zones that we trade with uh, are, are a little bit more uh, difficult to work with. Uh, but working hand in hand with CBP uh, under Department of Homeland Security, working with our own Sheriff's Department, uh, we make sure that we're able to maintain uh, a level of uh, level of security uh, that's uh, that's really unmatched. You throw in there the fact that we have the passengers uh, as well, uh, and that so then you end up with a personal uh, personal level of safety and security. Uh, that you're having to deal with. Now, within the, within the healthcare component of it, I think it's also uh, safe to, uh, to assume, and we're seeing this right now with, uh, with activities associated with the fast ferry, you can put all the great safety provisions and all the healthcare provisions in place, but human nature oftentimes brings people together. Uh, so when you're looking in the line, maintaining six feet, you need to maintain that six feet or whatever CDC guidelines uh, happen to be. Uh, so again, we cannot be mutually exclusive with our safety and our security. They have to run uh, hand in hand.
Thank you, JD. Or, yeah. Uh, uh, Gene, your your take on this? Yeah, Jorge, all the things that JD just explained, our work with allied agencies in the US, with our friends in Mexico and other trading partners, what we've seen specifically is the work around cybersecurity and that post COVID, just call it after March 1, our cyber intrusion attempts have doubled. We're now at an average of 44 million intrusion attempts per month. Long before it led us to look into the opportunity to build up a cyber resilience center, one that not only looked after the port and its infrastructure, but also our private sector partners. And based on a condition of anonymity, so we're not creating commercial concern for those who may have some weakness or witnessed intrusion attempts. Uh, this hopefully will make our community stronger, but a deep focus of ours going forward, in addition to the never ending list on the uh, security side of our assets, our crews, uh, our land-based operations, and our visitors uh, that come and work here at the port on a daily basis or those that may just find themselves here uh, uh, off to irregularity. Thank you, Gene. Uh, uh, certainly this is a health crisis that has created a social crisis, which in turn created an economic crisis. And it's just one of these vicious circles. Uh, uh, Miguel Angel, your, your take on this? To, to microphone, your, your mic is off. Sorry. Uh, I think that the three of us have the same uh, issue that is cyber security is relevant in this, that digital system is part of, of the whole thing. Uh, I would say that in, in Mexico, uh, the authorities have some uh, clear guidelines of what we needed to do. And as you mentioned, also the, the, the poor business were the first that they started to respond even before the, the contingencies started. We were already taking care of our, ourselves. And the poor community is very strong and we didn't have any problem with trying to, to uh, everyone coordinate, at least in Veracruz, in order to protect our our uh, our employment uh, our employees i'm sorry uh, just in the port of veracruz there are 10,000 employees uh, that's the more or less the the population the employment population in the port with all the port operators and everyone but i think the the challenge is to integrate here the the other parts of the the transportation chain vessels are very much in line uh, because they follow very much the conventions that are Follow, but for example, truckers or the railroads that are used to handle on their own, it's difficult to integrate on this and they will have to, I mean, there is no option. This is a great opportunity to do uh, a stronger and uh, change of, of communication and integration of information. Uh, thank you, Miguel Angel, uh, very much. In fact, uh, we have Carlos Obrador, who is a Mexican consul in Philadelphia, asking you if there is any maritime route from Veracruz to Philadelphia, and if so, which companies. And so this is something we're, we're coming on on the half an hour, and I would like to thank everybody for their time. And this is something that perhaps with the assistance of Clementina or Alex or their team, you can address this question with a consul uh, uh, personally and, and provide him with the information that he's looking for, Miguel Angel. And, uh, and the team, I'd be very grateful for that. Of course. I thank the panelists. We're, we've, we're, we're half an hour over time, uh, over the plan time, which, which means that people were interested and are still engaged. We have still 66 participants at this late hour. Uh, but with that, I would like to thank you, gentlemen, for both your time and your interest in participating in this wonderful event. I would like to take my leave, not only thanking you, the panelists for your time, and again, your brilliant uh, uh, presentations, but to the uh, team of the uh, United States-Mexico Chamber of Commerce uh, that has graciously put this together. I congratulate them. And with that, I will uh, say goodbye to everyone and give the floor back to Marlene and uh, Clementina. My special thanks to Alex as well uh, for his support on all of this, and all of you gentlemen, Thank you very, very much. It has been a pleasure participating. Thank right, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jorge, you, and Jorge, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our panelists on behalf of the U.S. Mexico Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we we would really would like to express our appreciation.
for your um, effort and the time invested in our project. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation and informative session. I would like also to give special thanks to General Albert Zapanta, CEO of the US Mexico Chamber of Commerce, for joining the seminar. Uh, Marlene Marroquin and Alejandro Ramos for this teamwork um, that uh, we can uh, create between the chapters. Um, thank you to our sponsors, uh, Baja Ferries and Inbound Logistics. And obviously, thank you to the audience, our members and friends. We hope all, um, uh, you all enjoy this webcast as much as we did. We will keep you informed of our future uh, webinars and projects. We look forward to continue working together and uh, please do not hesitate to contact us if you need something for you, for your company. We are here for you. Um, thank you, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening.